Hi, everybody. I know folks are continuing to join, but let me do a kind of slow opening here. Welcome to the Berman Institute bi-weekly seminar series. I'm Jeff Kahn. I'm the director of the Berman Institute, for those of you who don't know me. My pleasure to welcome you all today. And to introduce today's speaker, I'm going to turn it over to our colleague, Professor Casey Humbert, who is a, a connection and a, I think professional and personal with our speaker, and she'll do the honors of introducing uh, Dr. Wall today. So Angie, uh, sorry, Casey, over to you. Thank you so much. Well, it's an absolute honor and privilege to get to introduce Dr. G. Wall. Uh, Dr. Wall is a transplant surgeon focusing on abdominal transplant and works as a bioethicist as well at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. She holds the role of Vice Chair of Research at Baylor Simmons Transplant Institute, and she is the Chair of the Section of Surgical Professional Development. Her transplant research interests include transplant policy ethics, ethical and clinical questions in uterus transplantation, and perceptions of waitlisted patients regarding different types of donors. Her general surgery research interests include ethics and global surgery, resident and faculty wellness, as well as diversity. I so wish we could have Dr. Wall in person, but since uh, we cannot, this is the next best thing. Uh, Dr. Wall, Angie, thank you so much for making the time to spend today with us. We are really excited to hear about your work in this exciting new area. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Casey, for, uh, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak with all of you today. Um, Okay, perfect. Just making sure I'm unmuted and you guys can hear me. I'll take a thumbs up from someone. Casey, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great, perfect. So what I am going to talk with you all about today is the research that I've been doing since I've been at, uh, at Baylor on values, personal perspectives and experiences in uterus transplantation. And I'll tell you a little bit about our study here at Baylor as well, as the bigger clinical study, as well as the, um, the specific study on ethical issues and perspectives and so forth. So um, let me just begin by saying that I don't have any uh, financial relationships to disclose, and I don't have any off-label use or investi investigational use of pharmaceuticals, although this is obviously um, about uterus transplantation, which is a uh, which is currently in uh, only research uh, protocols as of right now in the United States. Although we'll talk about um, the clinical tran transition of uh, of uterus transplantation uh, toward the end. So let's start by talking about uterus transplantation. It is a procedure that is indicated for women who have absolute uterine factor infertility. And this can either be a condition called Rokitansky syndrome, also known as MRKH, uh, which is a congenital absence of the uterus with presence of the, um, of the ovaries, or an acquired condition from uh, surgical removal of the uterus for uh, many different reasons. Um, along with having absolute uterine infertility, the second part of the indication is the desire of the, uh, of the woman to have a pregnancy. The goal of uterus transplantation is to offer women a choice, um, a, the choice of being able to carry and deliver their own child, which is different from the alternative, alternatives to parenthood, adoption and surrogacy. The procedure itself um, is, begins with a uterus graft that can either come from a living or a deceased donor and that's implanted into the recipient's external iliac vessels. And then there's an end-to-end -end vaginal anastomosis that, uh, that's done. But the, the uterus transplant isn't just about this one surgery. And it's, it's really important to sort of show the bigger picture of what uterus transplant is about to provide context for our, um, for our research study. So uterus transplantation begins with like every transplant, medical and psychological evaluation of um, both donors and recipients, living donors and recipients. Um, the medical and psychological, if for deceased donors, um, there is a medical workup of, deceased, of the deceased donor as well. 
Um, after this evaluation for the recipients, they undergo in vitro fertilization. So like I said, all of our recipients in our study and in most studies across the world have ovaries. So their eggs are used for in vitro fertilization for creation of embryos. And once you get enough embryos, enough high quality embryos to meet whatever the research protocol is, then, then patients are listed for and receive a transplant. The listing um, can be listing for deceased donor transplant um, is just a waiting game until uh, an appropriately matched donor becomes available. For a living donor transplant, once a, once a potential recipient has um, enough high quality embryos and a match, then, uh, then you can um, proceed with uh, scheduling and going through with the transplant. After the, after the transplant, once the um, patient has, the recipient has recovered and um, is not on medications that are potentially teratogenic, then um, embryo transfer occurs. After embryo transfer, they go through pregnancy. And then the, the, then the delivery um, for uterus transplant patients is always, as of right now, this might change at some point in the future, um, is always done through cesarean section. So that's, that's the whole process. Um, notably, when we do, um, when we do deliver uh, the first baby, um, there, are, there are patients who wish to have a second pregnancy and if timing uh, allows and they don't have any complications um, that would contraindicate having a second pregnancy, we will leave the uterus in place for, uh, for the potential of a second pregnancy. And then they'll go through this process of the embryo transfer um, through pregnancy again. The uh, trial that we have right now is called the DUETS trial. It's a Dallas uterus transplant study. And um, we have uh, met some pretty cool milestones from a clinical perspective. We had the first live birth after uterus transplantation in the US and that was, um, that was reported in 2018. We've developed a novel technique for deceased donor workflow that actually is more similar to a living donor than to, um, than to a deceased donor um, where in the deceased donor workflows, typically the uterus is taken out at the very end after all the other abdominal organs. Whereas with our workflow for deceased donors, we do it like a living donor, take the uterus out before cross clamp and flush the uterus on the back table. So that's, that's kind of been an interesting addition to, uh, to practice, practice within the uterus transplant community. We uh, perform, perform the first fully robotic living donor hysterectomy um, in the world. And we've now done five uh, fully robotic living donor hysterectomies. This decreases um, post-operative hospitalization time and um, gets our donors back to work more quickly than the open donor hysterectomy. And then we recently performed a robotic graft hysterectomy in one of our recipients um, who had had a successful pregnancy and elected not to pursue a second pregnancy um, after, uh, after a few weeks after she had delivered. So um, because we didn't do the graft hysterectomy at the time of C-section, we offered her this, uh, this option of a robotic graft hysterectomy. So those are some of the, the kind of cool clinical milestones that we've, we've hit in our, uh, in our clinical research trial. And just overall, to give you all context, um, we have done 20 uterus transplants at, uh, at Baylor University Medical Center. 18 have come from living donors. And like I noted, five uh, were robotic donor hysterectomies. We have had two deceased donors. Um, and to date, we have 12, uh, 12 babies um, with one recipient who uh, has had two, uh, two healthy live births. So what we can say, I, I would argue, um, is that at this point from our study, we can say that uterus transplantation is technically feasible, it's reproducible, and it's safe. We're years into this study. We've had, um, while we've had graft losses, we haven't had any, um, any patient deaths, and we've reported all of our donor or recipient and we've reported all of our complications, which, um, which we can go into more detail in if anybody has any questions. But arguably, we can say those things. The question, and what I'm gonna focus on in this talk, is that 
or the, the, the issue is that these outcomes probably haven't convinced anybody that this is an ethically acceptable thing to do. So what I want to focus on is saying that, yes, we can do uterus transplants, but what evidence do we have or what argument can I give you that says we should do uterus transplants? And um, is it the opinion of bioethicists that counts in this argument or are there other opinions that really come into play? And what I'm gonna argue is that there is the population of patients who undergo uterus transplantation are really, really important in answering this question about should we, should we perform uterus transplants? So let's start with the ethical dilemma and let's talk about a few assumptions that I'm gonna make um, that we can argue about afterward. So the first thing is that um, I'm going to, I'm, our, our ethical dilemma is the question of should we do uterus transplant or what justifies a quality of life transplant like uterus transplantation? The assumption is that number one, we can meet the threshold of beneficence. Beneficence is um, maximizing the benefits and minimizing the risks of uterus transplantation. At this point, we can say, okay, you know, we have, um, we, uterus transplantation has, does achieve the good that we're looking for, which, or that, that our recipients are looking for, which is uh, the ability to carry, uh, to carry um, a pregnancy and have a healthy live birth. So does it do the good that we that we want it to? Yes. Respect for autonomy. Can we provide adequate informed consent for this for uterus transplantation? This is this may be this may be a sticking point for um, for many folks because it's such a complicated process. But hopefully throughout this presentation, I'll at least make make the um, the argument that we can um, and show some show some evidence to that point. And then finally, from a non-maleficent non standpoint, uh, again, uterus transplantation, we can at least show at this point, this is not exclusively harmful. We're not doing an operation that ends up not working 100% of the time. At this point, we have, we have shown that it's technically feasible, it's reproducible, and that patients do get the, the desired good, which is a healthy live birth um, from, uh, from uterus transplantation. The justice question I think is going to be right now, because we're in clinical trials, we're able to offer uterus transplantation um, based on clinical indications. However, when we get to the point of moving into uh, moving out of clinical trials into offering this as a clinical procedure, um, it's going to come with cost. And we know that infertility treatments come with a lot of cost. And so to say that we can we can just offer this to everybody would not be a fair would not be fair, but we but we can at least right now say that we are we can offer uterus transplantation to patients with absolute uterine factor infertility um, equally through clinical trials. We'll have to get we'll have to get down to um, a discussion of justice and justice concerns when we start transitioning to uh, to clinical application. So let's say that we can we can meet the thresholds of respect for autonomy with adequate informed consent of non-maleficence by not exclusively harming women who have who undergo the procedure of uterus transplantation and justice in that women with an indication for uterus transplantation are given the opportunity to have uterus transplantation through clinical trials. If we could do all of that, let's say we can do all of that, then the central question um, comes down to do the benefits of uterus transplantation outweigh the risks? Do we, we can do, we can do or achieve this good that we're setting out to achieve, but, but do we really get the benefit that we're looking for? Do our recipients really get the benefit that we, that they want? And does the value that they get or the benefit that they get outweigh the risks that they put themselves under with multiple surgeries, um, high risk pregnancy, et cetera? So let's go on to a couple of other assumptions that come from the sort of 
other side. So if you look back at the last about 20 years of ethics literature on uterus transplantation, there are several specific concerns with uterus transplantation. Number one is that there will be a therapeutic misconception that that participants in the clinical trial will overestimate the benefits and underestimate the risks of uterus transplantation because of their desire to carry a pregnancy. Number two, there, there, is, there are a lot of arguments that uh, focus on the fact that uterus transplantation, while it will provide the opportunity for pregnancy, the pregnancy experience of somebody after uterus transplantation is going to be significantly different than a quote unquote normal pregnancy so pregnancy after uterus transplantation will not carry the same value as a, as a quote unquote, again, normal pregnancy. Number three, the value of uterus transplantation is specifically linked to pregnancy. Um, there are pros and cons to using this as, uh, as an argument that we'll go into in a little bit. And then there's also this perception that uterus transplantation is just a quality of life transplant. And there are other ways to achieve the quality of life that are that um, uterus transplant um, offers, which is ultimately parenthood. So, um, is it again? Is it really worth it for just a quality of life transplant? So, let's talk about what we did to try to answer some of these questions and to try to see, you know, do these arguments stand up in real life? We performed semi-structured interviews of all of the uterus transplant recipients at Baylor. So, an N, N of twenty. We asked them about experiences with uterine factor infertility, experiences with uterus transplantation and pregnancy, and then some responses to public perceptions of uterus transplantation. And then we took these uh, responses and performed a thematic analysis of all of the um, interview transcripts. And I'm gonna go through um, what we found, some of the major themes that we found in these interviews. But before I do that, let's go ahead and talk about the characteristics of our patients. So overall, our, um, our uterus transplant recipients and the participants in the study were young. They were in their 20s to 30s, um, normal BMI. Um, the interviews ranged anywhere from two to 40 months after, uh, after uterus transplantation. So what that allowed us to do was, um, was interview patients who were in very different uh, stages after the uterus transplant. We'll talk about that on the next uh, slide. Um, overall, mostly white, non-Hispanic, and um, mostly highly educated. Um, so that's that's sort of the breakdown of our of our patient population, our participant population. You can see here that um, most of our participants have MRKH or congenital absence of the uterus. Uh, most of the patients did not have children prior to uterus transplant, although three had an adopted child, one had a stepchild, and one had a uh, child uh, through surrogacy. The stage of uterus transplantation here, we had during the interview, seven were pregnant, four had a viable graft that was awaiting embryo transfer. So they were kind of early after uterus transplantation. Six had experienced an early graft loss and graft hysterectomy prior to being able to go down the road of embryo transfer. And then three of our patients who had already had a, uh, a successful pregnancy had, um, had gone through a graft hysterectomy at the point of interview. And then you can see here our donor as um, donor type 17 were living un unknown or altruistic donors. One was a living known donor and then two were deceased donors. So what we found first in asking our patients about their life experience with um, uterine factor infertility was that there were three themes that came up in participant um, uh, descriptions of their diagnosis. First, participants were diagnosed at a young age. So the diagnosis of absolute uterine factor infertility impacted several stages of their lives, their teenage years, dating, marriage, et cetera. Second, the diagnosis of absolute uterine factor infertility was isolating. They felt very alone in this diagnosis and different from their peers. Finally, participants uh, described how absolute uterine factor infertility negatively impacted what they talked about as a female identity. They, um, they, uh, one described herself as feeling it less like a woman. So it specifically came down to what they felt like um, as, as their female or feminine identity was affected by absolute uterine factor infertility. Now, to go a little bit more in detail with these findings, here are some representative uh, quotations from, um, from our participants. 
So one participant said, and you kind of close yourself off to other girls early from my experience because you couldn't talk about when you got your first period. You weren't the girl with a pad or a tampon. Another, uh, another talked about the, the female identity. She said, and in order to have that identity as a woman completely taken away from me was pretty hard. When you're told at a young age that it's just not an option for you to have your own child, how that like cuts into you. Like you can't describe that. It feels like part of you is just ripped out and completely taken away. So this was a really significant, uterine factor infertility had a very strong, significant impact on our participants. And um, again, this was a negative impact from a young age. It affected multiple life stages. It resulted in feelings of isolation and it affected participants female identity. So now let's look at the flip side of this at why our participants were motivated to pursue uterus transplantation. So our participants described their motivations to pursue uterus transplantation in terms of three factors. The first was a desire to experience pregnancy, not just a desire to be a parent. A second was um, to contribute to making, making uterus transplantation an option for other women with absolute uterine factor infertility. And then a third was this desire to define by the odds through pregnancy and childbirth because they had been told forever since from a very young age that this was not a possibility for them, specifically our recipients who had MRKH who were diagnosed in their teenage years. Again, some representative quotations on motivations. I wanted to be pregnant. I wanted to have the entire experience that all other women in the universe, it seems, are able to have. Another participant said, and even if this doesn't work for me, I wanted to be able to move forward with research for other girls who are coming out behind me, who are 16, 17 year old, years old and getting diagnosed. And then a third said, I wasn't doing this just because. It was because I was told I would never be able to do this, that, that idea of defying the odds. Now, not only were our participants motivated to undergo uterus transplantation, they also noted that the alternatives to uterus transplantation had limitations. Three limitations that came up in our, in our interviews were that the alternative options of adoption and surrogacy had financial and logistical challenges. There were cultural and religious reasons not to pursue those alternative options. And there was also a perception by many participants that uterus transplantation was completely different from the options of adoption and surrogacy, so they really couldn't all be compared to each other. This quotation here kind of demonstrates some of these limitations. So my partner and I started looking into surrogacy and adoption, and they just didn't feel right. Surrogacy felt like it was all about the money, and adoption is very much that way too. At that point in our lives, it, talking about adoption, wasn't the right fit for us. I think with other options, it just felt like we'll explore this for a little while, but I don't have an aching desire to go these routes but I had an aching desire for uterus transplantation. This is how I could see my family starting. Now, another question, and this comes up all the time when I talk to, uh, you know, when I talk to groups about uterus transplantation is getting down to why didn't you just adopt or do surrogacy? Here are some of the quotations specifically addressing that question. That really upsets me. I just wanna to respond to them and ask them why didn't they adopt? Why did they choose to have their own children? And why didn't they adopt or do surrogacy? It's because they have the option to have their own children. But women who have MRKH or who have had their uterus removed for other reasons, they don't have that option. Well, we do now. Another participant just stated, being infertile doesn't mean I have to be the savior of adopted children. This might be harsh, but this is a sentiment that came up over and over again that just because we didn't have the option to have children doesn't mean that we should be um, pressured into adoption. Now, the consideration of alternatives, just to kind of summarize this, adoption and surrogacy are not free of financial, logistical, religious, um, and cultural barriers. Uterus transplantation was seen as fundamentally different than adoption and surrogacy because it was the only one that allowed participants to carry their own pregnancies. And then participants felt more pressure to defend their decision not to adopt than they felt pressure to pursue uterus transplantation. And that's one of the findings that really speaks against this idea of therapeutic misconception. They're, they actually felt pressured against uterus transplantation rather than toward uterus transplantation. 
We also asked our, our participants about the value of uterus transplantation. And despite, um, or perhaps, you know, beyond the seemingly obvious value of experiencing pregnancy and motherhood, our participants found that there were many aspects of uterus transplantation that were valuable. For example, the mere option of uterus transplantation had value. One participant said that I used to feel super different and alone in having MRKH, but just being accepted and having that option of uterus transplant handed to me was healing in itself. Those, those participants who had failures also found value in participating in um, the research study that would result in the option of uterus transplant for women in the future. When asked if uterus transplant was worth it, one of the participants who had early graft failure said the following. And now, the, and now there is now that 16 or 17 year old finding out that she has MRKH and now she has hope for the future. Now she has options. So was it worth it? Yes. Not only was the opportunity to have a pregnancy valuable, but the experience of menstruation was also valuable in solidifying the female identi identity of some of our um, participants and of them becoming part of the, uh, what they felt was a common female experience. So one participant said, when I had the uterus transplant and I started having periods, it finally clicked to me that I was a woman whether or not, whether I had a period or not. Um, but it took, actually having the uterus transplant for her to kind of feel, feel that way. Another one of our participants, I don't have the quote up here, but another one talked about how having a period was really valuable to her because her, she was able to help her daughter, um, her uh, daughter who she had had through surrogacy navigate menstruation in the future. So now I can, now I can, you know, talk to my daughter about this. The Major conclusions that we had kind of coming, coming out of this, uh, this specific study is that absolute uterine factor infertility is a negative life-altering diagnosis that affected our participants' feminine identity and affected multiple life stages. We found that the primary motivation for uterus transplantation is specific to the pregnancy experience not just a generalized desire to, uh, to, for motherhood or for parenthood. Also, the alternative options of adoption and surrogacy have barriers and they're fundamentally different from uterus transplantation. There are reasons why women choose uterus transplantation above or before adoption or surrogacy. And finally, the value of uterus transplantation it was multifactorial. There were many different aspects of value that our participants found in the process of uterus transplantation. And it was also deeply personal. There were many different reasons that our participants said they gained value from this experience. And I, I think that this next slide really solidified for me part of the value of uterus transplantation that I didn't even think about when I kind of started down the, the journey of this, uh, of this study. So this is the value of changing minds and the value of listening to our patients and to participants. So one of our uh, recipients said, or our participants said, I had a doctor that participated in my C-section and this was after uterus transplantation that actually came into my postpartum room and told me I was against these transplants until I was in the room with you. And so to hear that from a medical professional who was completely against these transplants because he thought they were a waste of money and a waste of time. And then to hear my story and to see my, my baby girl be born, people just can't put a number on that financially. And they can't say it's not worth it unless they're in our shoes and they see why we're doing this. So what I wanna end with are some final thoughts. Number one, there is so much work that needs to be done to define the field of ethics in uterus transplantation. And this is just a little piece, just the tip of the iceberg, I think, um, in, in what we are starting to, to do in, um, in trying to push this field forward. And the biggest thing, if you can take just one final point away from this presentation, is that we cannot assume that our outside perceptions are true, that we as bioethic, bioethicists or clinicians have the answers. In quality of life transplantation and in uterus transplantation, 
we need the stories of our stakeholders to inform the analysis of the ethical questions. So with that, I would love to hear comments, questions, et cetera. And before I end, I have to say thank you to our uterus transplant team, Monica Sock, who uh, did this study with me as uh, one of our OBGYN residents, Lisa Johansson, our, the director of uterus transplantation here, and the person who's probably done the most uterus transplants in the world on both humans and, um, and uh, a variety of different animal models. Elisa Gordon from Northwestern, who uh, has been a huge supporter and uh, helped us design uh, this particular study. Giuliano Testa, our division chief, um, who, who launched the uterus transplant program and uh, has been nothing but supportive of pushing forward with studying uh, the ethical aspects of this, um, of this procedure. And then Kristen Wallace and Heather Pertle, who are our nurse coordinators in uterus transplant. So with that, I am gonna stop my slideshow so that we can have a screen of people um, asking questions and I'll open it up. Thanks uh, so much, Angie. Um, really interesting uh, work that you're doing. Um, I'm gonna take over Casey here and just help moderate the Q and A a little bit. Um, maybe try to get things in order of how they've appeared. We have some uh, questions in the Q and A pod as well as in the chat block box here. So I'm gonna um, maybe if I could, I'll just start. If you could say a, a little bit more, I'll, I'll take a prerogative here and, and ask you to say a little yeah. bit more about what kind of um, pushback there is from ethicists and others that you've heard of any um, um, in terms of this procedure. It sounded like you touched on some of it in your presentation as being related to perhaps the cost and maybe um, maybe the fact that there, there are alternatives out there that people may believe that um, women should be taking advantage of. It's hard to tell. But anyway, if you could say yes. more about what kind of what, what's the resistance and um, what kinds of forms mm -hmm. it takes and what are the ethical arguments, that'd be really Interesting. I think, Absolutely. So, so I think that the the initial the initial arguments focused on risk and value. So there, it, and if you take risk and value, sort of put it together, does this meet the threshold of beneficence? Are the risks? Do the risks of uterus transplantation or the potential complications outweigh the? Do the risks outweigh the benefits, or vice versa? And so early on in uterus transplantation, there were that one, there were a lot more unknowns. And so the risks were not only the risks that we knew about, which are multiple surgeries, C-section, high risks, you know, high risk pregnancy. Um, the fact that you have to have a uterus transplant, a C-section, and then the initial trial had uh, the graft hysterectomy would be done at least eight weeks after the C-section. So three surgeries plus everything else that goes into it. So do, do all of those things, do, do the risks of all of those things added together really, are they really okay given that the benefit is having, you know, being able to have your own child? So that, so that is sort of the, what really the major ethical argument comes down to. Um, and then there are other side arguments like that, um, that, that, that focus on how do we define value? And is pregnancy after uterus transplantation equally or close to equally as valuable as the uh, as what we would consider a normal pregnancy? So, so some of the ethical arguments that I found very interesting and what actually started this line of research were that they said, um, Patients who undergo uterus transplantation, they don't have the nerves reconnected. So they're not going to feel, they're not going to feel fetal movement. They're not going to have, you know, the same hormonal, um, um, I don't know, milieu as, uh, as women who are just naturally pregnant. Um, and so because, because it's going to be such a different experience, because they're not going to have that same, those same, you know, nerve connections and so forth, they're not gonna have the pregnancy experience that they wanted. So the value of pregnancy after uterus transplantation isn't even gonna be there. So even if they get to that ultimate point of having a child, it's not gonna be as valuable as a normal pregnancy. So that's actually where we started our research. We started by asking 
our two patients who had had a pregnancy, if they felt fetal movement and if they had like hormonal changes. And it turns out they did. So it's actually way more similar to a normal pregnancy than not. But that's just one of those ethical arguments that kind of comes up. But ultimately it comes down to risk and benefit. Does the risk of a transplant and all the things that go along with it, is that, you know, does that outweigh or does the benefit outweigh the risk? Let's see. Um, so there are a few, a couple of questions in the chat here in the Q&A um, that relate to, they're, they're somewhat related, um, mm -hmm. that relate to uh, uterine transplants, for example, for gender confirming surgery and um, another individual asking if you could speak to expanding uterine transplants to trans women um, and whether your sort of ethical arguments transfer um, to other, other um, people who may be seeking transplants. Um, so yeah, so there are a few comments to that effect. Maybe you'd like to speak to that. There, there have been some, um, there, there have been some arguments that have been made, or some, some centers that have at least in theory considered um, uh, uterus transplantation for uh, gender confirmation surgery. One of the issues is that as of right now, we limit the patients who uh, undergo uterus transplantation to women who have functioning ovaries because that, that's actually really important for, um, for being able to have a pregnancy and maintain, you know, and maintain the graft and the viable pregnancy. So we haven't crossed that barrier. We, haven't, we, we also have not offered uterus transplantation to women who have had you know, a, a radical hysterectomy where, they've, where the, um, or self-pingo oophorectomy along with a hysterectomy because they do need to have functioning ovaries in place in order for, um, in order for us to be able to, to support them through the pregnancy. Now we know that there are ways to hormonally support a pregnancy in the absence of functional ovaries. So it's not like a hundred percent barrier, um, but there are enough barriers in place right now medically that we don't think we're at the point where we could offer this as a gender confirmation surgery. The second thing is that we do have a time limit to the, uh, to the uterus. So the graft in our center and in most programs um, uh, can only stay in place for five years. And that's because of the risk of immunosuppression over the long term. Um, there is an increased risk of cancer, there's a risk of infections. And so the shorter graft life, the better. Um, so we are not offering uterus transplantation as a permanent transplant. And that might be a barrier to the uh, consideration of uterus transplantation for gender confirmation rather than specifically for the purpose of having a pregnancy and then removing the graft afterward. So right now, I mean, it, it might be an argument in theory, but, it, but we are not there. We can't, we're not there medically, clinically, and the indication is very specific for, uh, for pregnancy. Um, there's another question about um, whether you saw any qualitative differences in responses between participants who did or did not have a successful pregnancy. Um, be interested in so we did, we did ask spe two specific questions, I think, that are very important. So number one, we asked every participant, was uterus transplantation worth it? Just flat out, was it worth it? And every one of our 20 participants said yes, which is most certainly a recall, a bias toward having made the choice to undergo uterus transplantation. Um, we did not, we, we only asked people who had undergone uterus transplantation. So was it worth it? Yes, every single participant said yes. So there was no difference there. The other question that we asked our participants that I think speaks to if there may have been differences is what information would you have liked to know, would you have liked to know prior to uterus transplantation? And then we said, some participants said, no, I had all the information. Others said, I would have liked to know X, Y, or Z. And then we coded that as needed more information, did not need more information. And on bivariate analysis, there was no difference between the um, participants who had had a successful pregnancy or at least had a successful graft um, implantation versus those who had had, um, had had an early graft loss. Um, could I maybe ask while others are um, welcome others to, to write questions in the Q&A if, if you'd like. Um, I wanted to pick up on something you raised, I think at the beginning or near the beginning of your talk about um, justice, justice related concerns. And um, yes, I thought it'd be nice if you could return to that maybe and say a bit more about what specifically the concerns are in the context of a 
of the research Absolutely. as you're conducting research right now, but also maybe even beyond that, um, looking forward um, into sort of more regular clinical applications. Yeah, so justice is, is not, justice related concerns are um, not foreign to transplantation. At baseline in transplantation, we already have um, a common ethical, co complex ethical issues with the allocation of solid organs, of life-saving organs, because there are way more people who need organs than who um, than than donors available. So that's sort of the baseline. Like we we are often struggling with um, with supply and demand issues. The, the additional issue with uterus transplantation from a justice perspective is that um, when it becomes clinically available, so right now in clinical, in right now, there are, there are only a few programs in the United States who offer uterus transplantation, and it is currently under clinical trials. And because of that, the transplant itself is paid for by, uh, with research funding. So um, participants don't pay for the majority of the costs. In our study, they did pay for um, or have insurance cover if it did um, the IVF part. Um, so the main justice concern that is kind of on top of just the question of allocation is when we move into the clinical application of uterus transplantation, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be on par with, you know, what a kidney transplant costs or um, it, it will be more expensive than for most likely than either surrogacy or adoption. Um, and the question the question becomes who is going to be able to afford it and is it fair to offer uterus transplantation when there are only like a very small number of, patients with uterine factor infertility who will actually be able to afford this in the absence of insurance coverage. And at least now what we, you know, from, from the infertility community as a whole, we know that it's a struggle to get any sort of infertility treatment covered by insurance. And it's unlikely that uterus transplantation is going to be covered if we don't even cover IVF for most people. Um, so that's the that is really what's coming out as a main as a major justice concern is how are you is it is it ethical to offer this procedure to only a small subset of the population who's going to be able to afford it? Thanks. Um, I see David Myers has a few questions here. Maybe I'll, I'll try to parse this out. It, it looks like he's interested okay. in hearing a bit more about um, donor related. Uh, questions or issues. Um, so in particular, is mm -hmm. what, what are the characteristics of donors? What are the reasons for donating? Are they postmenopausal or uh, questions maybe related to that stage of, um, and, and then a way, is it a way to use old organs? I take it. So maybe we'll take those first and then. Um, okay. So let's start with the donors. Um, donors, um, it's quite, it's interesting because, um, the original study that was done in Sweden was nine recipients of living donors. And all of the living donors in that study were related and they were mostly um, mothers donating to their daughters. So that was, that was what sort of the original study uh, design was. And when we designed our clinical trial, we told potential recipients, you need to you know, see if you can find a family member or somebody who would be willing to donate. But we also opened up the trial when we when we were recruiting patients, um, recipients. We also had a recruitment letter for donors, and we had over 200 women apply who, as altruistic donors. Um, and what and so I'm currently in the process of interviewing all the donors. I've gone, I've interviewed 12 of the 18, and I can tell you number one characteristics of our altruistic donors. Interestingly, many of them work in healthcare. Um, specifically as nurses and MPs. Um, they're all, uh, they have all had children and have completed childbearing to the best of their knowledge. Um, all but one of our donors were premenopausal. Um, and the reason why is that our one postmenopausal donor 
Um, actually, the graft, uh, we had a graft failure and we think par it was partially due to the uh, older age of the donor. So we've restricted our age down um, to 40. So all of our donors are going to be um, premenopausal. Um, and reasons, motivations for donating are <laughs> kind of interesting. I mean, some of them are like, well, I had such a wonderful experience with pregnancy and with my children that I just wanted to give another woman that option. We have one who was uh, was an egg donor and a surrogate. She didn't want to do surrogacy again, but she felt like, you know, well, I don't need my uterus anymore. Let me give it to somebody else. We've had two donors who um, who had to undergo a hysterectomy for one reason or another, but the 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 uterus was fine. And so they were looking for something to do with their uterus, like maybe somebody else can use it since I'm going to have to have it taken out anyway. So the motivations are very interesting um, uh, because, because 17 of our 18 donors were altruistic. They don't know their recipients. The one who knew her recipient um, wanted to donate specifically to her friend who she felt, um, you know, who, who she knew had this condition. Um, so I think that answers most of those questions. Way to use old organs. I mean, I guess if I, I guess if you say, you know, there are a lot of women who undergo hysterectomy for one reason or another, or who are done with childbearing, who who don't care whether or not they keep their uterus, then yes, there that is, you know, that is sort of some of the motivation for our donors. Thanks. Um, oh, and then sorry, I saw the second the second yeah. question about um, C-section and long-term issue with babies. Uh, recipients currently always need a C-section and that is um, for multiple reasons, but MRKH, uh, typically they have a, a kind of underdeveloped uh, vaginal canal. So um, they're unlikely to be able to have, um, to have a vaginal birth. And then you also have the, um, so hand, the anastomosis, the vaginal anastomosis. So you don't really wanna put that under, um, under stress. Um, and then as for long-term issues with the babies, as of right now, I mean, we're following our, um, we're following the babies. Our oldest one is, um, maybe at this point, four years old. Um, and there are no, um, that they have normal development, at least the, the ones that we're following for the phases that they're in, um, are along the lines of normal development. Now, um, as we have more and more children from uterus transplantation, we would expect that some are going to be on very on, all along the spectrum of development, just as um, you know babies are in general. Um, but as of right now, we don't have we haven't seen long term sequelae from uh, uterus transplantation with our uh, with the babies. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple more questions about on the do donor side of things. I think you addressed one of them already, um, but. There are two here. One relates to any special informed consent issues around donation from deceased donors in particular. Um, you know, again, thinking that some people may not have anticipated that their, you know, that the uterus would be used and that it would be used in the way it is. Um, also in the chat box here, I have a question uh, about the pros and cons, anything from your study about pros and cons of related versus unrelated, um, biologically related, I assume, donors. Um, from in terms of clinical outcomes, psychosocial implications. So, so yeah, one question on the deceased donor side, one on the. On the okay, so let's start with the deceased donor question. Um, yes, there are there are special informed consent issues. So, um, as the uh, Sonia um, noted, I don't imagine people are thinking of uterine transplant and their role in assisting reproduction. So, right now, because uterus transplantation is a is under research. The consent for uterus donation is a separate consent um, in, in a, as a research um, consent piece. Um, the specific uh, information that, uh, that is given to deceased donors is that, uh, or to the families of deceased donors, um, is, is that no genetic material is, um, is transferred during uterus donation. So we do not, we do not transplant the ovaries. Um, and there, so, and the embryo is uh, um, obviously comes from the recipient and their partner. Um, so there is no, uh, there's no genetic relationship, biological relationship to, uh, to the donor. The uterus is just used as, um, as a vessel for, um, for carrying a pregnancy. Um, so moving forward into the clinical application, 
Uh, it's unclear how exactly the consent process is going to uh, going to be done. Um, but at least the way that consent is for deceased donation right now, um, the family authorizes consent and they authorize uh, all organs and tissues for research and um, and transplantation. So you can make a choice of, you can either do that or you can say specific organs, only research, only transplantation, et cetera. And so what I think will ultimately happen, and this, you know, this is this is going through the policy, you know, policy stuff right now, um, is that uterus is going to be one of the organs under all the things that can be donated that the, the family can make a decision, yes or no. Um, it's, it's a little bit complex because uterus is currently considered a VCA and VCAs also are like arm and face and things like that. And when you get into the question of like, how do you do consent for arm and face donation? You worry about um, open casket funerals and, um, and physical uh, disfiguration of the donor. And so the, those issues have come up in the VCA community and are, are kind of still discussed, are discussed even around uterus transplantation, even though it's, it's an internal organ that doesn't take more of an incision than um, your basic abdominal organs. So yes, there are special informed consent issues. They're still in the works figuring out how to transition to clinical um, application. As for the, uh, what was the other question? The other one was about whether related or unrelated donors have any implications yes. for outcomes and yeah. So outcomes wise, no, living donors, at least right now, living donors have better outcomes than deceased donors, but it could, the N is so small that there's no way you can say that that's not just a selection bias. So we've had more babies from living donors than we have from deceased donors. That's not just our center, that's across the world. As for related versus unrelated, um, we have all unrelated donors, so I can't really speak to you know my what what we've studied versus the um, the Swedish team, but um, we do. It's prob there probably is a difference from a psycho psychosocial perspective. So unrelated donors, number one, they don't they don't know their recipients. They're not tied to the outcomes, and that's something that we found. Like they're like, look, I. I gave my uterus, I gave this person the opportunity to have a pregnancy. I hope that they have a good outcome, but I have done, you know, I have done what I set out to do, which was to donate this and to, to provide this opportunity. Whereas I think that if you ask the same sort of questions to, um, to donors who are related or who know the recipient, they're gonna be much more invested in what the outcome of the recipient is to, you know, did they have a pregnancy or not? Did they, did they have a child or not? So um, I do think there'll be some differences there. We, I just can't say 100%. And in, in, your, in the context of your study, was there an opportunity for people who are living donors to, be, um, to voluntarily be known? Um, and how did that play out? And what were some of, did you have a chance to explore the decision-making factors that went into people's decisions to be known or unknown? So we have, um, in our study, our, donors and recipients are allowed to meet each other after the graft hysterectomy. So they, so we, we've kind of set a limit to, they have to, the, the recipients have to have kind of completed their, the entire process before they meet their donor. Um, and we may change that in the future. Um, and the recipient and the donor have to both agree to meet. Um, we have had, we've had now three, women who have had successful pregnancies and graft hysterectomies. And so they have, so those groups have met, um, those women have met their, uh, their donors. And it's all, you know, we have one, I think it's our first recipient um, who her and her donor have become like, they live close to, they live close to each other. They found out they live relatively close. Her donor is the godparent of, um, of her child. And they have, they have like a very close relationship. And then we have others where they've met and they, you know, they exchange letters and so forth, but they're, they're not very like interconnected. Um, but, but even, even just being able to meet the recipient and meet the baby, it seems to have been a valuable, uh, valuable for our donors and the ones who haven't hoped to meet their recipients in the future. 
Um, we have another clarifying question here um, about why a uh, post-pregnancy hysterectomy is, is indicated. It's indicated, yep. Yeah. So um, overall, it's in, in general, a hysterectomy is indicated because we don't, we don't want to continue immunosuppression um, indefinitely in, in our uterus transplant patients. So it's indicated so that we can withdraw from, we can withdraw the uh, the patient from immunosuppression. The uh, question of if it's indicated at the time of C-section versus like post-pregnancy, like waiting, um, we we're still kind of struggling with that. Um, we try to we try to make it a patient-driven decision so they can decide if they want to have the C the hysterectomy at the time of C-section or later, um, because we've from experience now, we found that it can be really tough to go through a hysterectomy emotionally for these patients because um, they become sort of attached to the uterus in different ways um, and attached to the fact that they, they have the ability to be pregnant. Um, so some of them do not want to have a C-section at the time or have a hysterectomy at the time of C-section because it, it sort of makes what should be a very happy day also kind of have this negative piece, um, negative emotional piece put into it. So um, that's actually part of our, our study going forward is we're gonna talk, we're, we've added questions about graft hysterectomy and um, about um, attachment to the uterus and so forth um, uh, to, our, to our question guide. And we're gonna talk with all of our patients about that. In Sweden, it was the, so we have a lot of the experience from Sweden because Lisa Johannesson, um, who's here, uh, conducted that study as well. Um, and so they didn't have any, none of their participants actually felt a connection to the uterus and none of them struggled with graft hysterectomy. So we didn't expect for that to happen in our, in our patients. And then it did. So now we're kind of trying to navigate that part of the process um, with them. And are, are transplants reusable or, sorry, my ignorant question. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. The uterus itself is not, uh, is not reusable because you have to take the vessels pretty high. Um, so you can't, you can't use it again. Um, however, we have, we do have um, one participant who had uh, an early graft failure and she is like, so on board, she's like, if you guys ever are going to do a redo, um, I want to, I'll go, I'd go through it again, you know, so so it, there is a potential for women who have had a, a failed graft to undergo um, a second transplant if they if they they feel you know strongly about it. But we just we haven't done it yet here. Um, I think there may have been there. I'm not sure if there have been any redo transplants in the world yet. But it, that is a potential. The opposite, utilizing a graft again, is not. I see. Um, so another question here, um, how prevalent in the US or worldwide is the total uterine condition you're looking at for which you know, transplant, the urine transplant is the solution? So the, the um, ASRM, which is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine estimates that uterine factor infertility, which is either, again, it's not just MRKH, it's anybody who um, has, a, has a uterus that it has the complete absence of a uterus, either surgical or congenital, um, is one to 5% of uh, the population. So it's actually really prevalent um, when it comes to, you know, it's more prevalent than you might think. Um, just to give you all context for our study. So we did 20, we did 20 uterus transplants. That was from uh, 750 applicants, and that's just for one study. And that was for the first phase of our study. And we had several hundred more for, uh, our first phase was 10 uterus transplants, and we had a couple hundred more um, add in to when we did a second phase. Um, so there are a lot of women, not only with uterine factor infertility, but who have enough of a desire to pursue, who had enough of a desire to pursue our research trial. Um, and we, you know, again, when we get into clinical, into the clinical application, it's really going to diminish the number of people who are able to go through uterus transplant because of the cost and the tech, you know, all of the, they'll have to live in Dallas or in one of the few cities where uterus transplant, um, is being done and so forth. So, 
I don't think that it's going to be, you know, a 200 procedure a year or anything like that, but there'll probably be a handful every year in, in the bigger centers. All right. Well, I'm afraid, uh, Dr. Wall, that we've used up all our time, but thank you for um, an excellent talk and sharing this sort of uh, convoluted area that's emerging. And just on behalf <laughs> of JC and Jeff, um, and we just offer our thanks again. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Angie. Great to see all of you. Thank Good you so much for the too. opportunity. And um, I look Fantastic forward Fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. Of course. Look forward to uh, the next meeting with the fellows next. Thanks for doing that. All right. Y'all have a great day. You too. Thanks.